Father Frank Pavone canceled from the priesthood? W removed from the priesthood? Really? What could be the issue here? Father Frank Pavone gets removed from the priesthood, but Father, what's the guy's name? Rupnik, the Jesuit who molested nine uh, nuns, gets, to, gets, gets his excommunication lifted within hours from His Holiness Pope Francis. Father James Martin gets to continue on. I mean, there's just so many stories we might go to and say, like the, the priest in Italy who did the flotation mass out in the Adriatic Sea where teens were in, like, very scandalous bathing suit material. Like, this is okay, but Father Pavone gets removed from the priesthood. Let's conversate about that. Here's the article that I saw out of the Catholic News Agency. Headline says, Vatican dismisses Father Frank Pavone from, from the priesthood. <clears throat> This story broke on Saturday, by the way. How many stories break on Saturday? Just curious. The ones they want no one to talk about? Yeah, there's a, there's a clue right there. Uh, but here's a little bit of the article. Father Frank Pavone, a well-known pro-life activist and national director of the organization Priest for Life, has been dismissed from the clerical state for blasphemous communications on social media and persistent disobedience of the lawful instructions of his diocese and bishop, CNA, has learned. In a December the 13th, and the dates do matter here, that in a December the 13th letter to the U.S. bishops attained by CNA and confirmed by multiple sources as authentic. Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the apostolic nuncio to the United States, wrote that the prefect of the dicastery for the clergy issued the decision on December the 9th, adding that there was no possibility of, of appeal. All right, so the dates matter. The issue, the decision comes down December the 9th, December the 13th, a letter goes out to the bishops article goes on to say, Father Pavone was given ample opportunity to defend himself in the canonical proceedings, and he was also given multiple opportunities to submit himself to the authority of his diocesan bishop, explains a separate statement attached to Pierre's letter. It was determined that Father Pavone had no reasonable justification for his actions. Pavone, however, told the CNA uh, Saturday that he had not been notified about the Vatican's judgment. Could you imagine? December the 9th, the letter, the decision comes down. He doesn't find out until December the 17th. If you are removed from the priesthood, you don't have faculties. You can't say a legitimate mass. You can't hear confessions. What does that mean for anybody he provided sacraments to during that time that he was unaware? Now, Adrian, could you play that clip for me? This is a clip from an hour and 45 minute video response Father Pavone provided on his YouTube channel and on his uh, Twitter feed. Adrian? That's all. That is. <clears throat> and they always try to complicate it and make it mysterious. They'll say that I did blasphemous communications on social media. Yeah. I went overboard with one person. It wasn't even a post. It was a response in a one-on-one in a, in a -on -one communication. And I was mad, and I had good reason to be mad, and I used the, the term uh, uh, GD. Sorry, I went to confession. Keep playing. You see, it's not about that. They just want to find some excuse. Throw Father Frank out of the priesthood. Tell you a story. The Bishop of Amarillo, some of you were asking, well, who is this bishop that's been causing so much problem for you? Um, the, the Bishop of, of Amarillo, Texas. He's, this, he's in his final year there anyway as bishop, but uh, Zurich is his name. And he called me into a meeting five years ago. He was, you know, complaining about my work like he always does. And he said, um, he said, well, you know, you, you, I don't want you doing this, uh, doing this work. And I said, well, you want me in the diocese? You want me to do, you know, you want to give me an assignment in the diocese? Is there any benefit to me being in the diocese? And he said, no. So he didn't want me doing work in the diocese, and he didn't want to let me do work outside the diocese. And I knew this already. So I said, well, you want me out of the priesthood, don't you? Now, there were other witnesses in this meeting, and I can tell you who they are, too. And they know, and they remember this. And he said, never, never, twice, out loud, never, never. I would never want you out of the priesthood. This is my bishop talking to me. Never, never. Remember that, bishop? I'm sure he'll see this video. Never, never. This is in 2017. A few weeks later, after that meeting, I get a letter from him. 
saying, I want you to request to be dismissed from the priesthood. And if you don't request it, I'm going to request the Vatican to dismiss you from the priesthood. So there is an ongoing history here between Father Frank Pavone and the bishop in Amarillo, Bishop Zurich. It goes back many years, in fact, and uh, the article at CNA points this out uh, in 2000. Eight, when that bishop uh, came to that diocese, there was al already some uh, conflicts there. In 2011, 2012, Father Pavone gets recalled to the diocese, and there was restrictions placed upon him. Apparently, the Vatican got involved, and some of those restrictions did get lifted, and he was able to go back to work. Now, Father Pavone tried to uh, get, uh, you know, switch dioceses. He tried to go to Colorado Springs, apparently. Uh, it's unclear exactly how successful that was, because clearly this decision has come down because of repeated and ongoing conflicts between Father Pavone and the bishop in Amarillo. And there's two sides to the coin, to be sure. There's another side to this. I'd like to play another clip. This is from Father Imbarato. And by the way, truth in advertising, we've had Father Frank Pavone on this program a few times. We've also had Father Imbarato on this program a few times. Father Imbarato worked for Father Pavone for a while. Would you play that clip for us? I you that what happened does not surprise me. What does surprise me is it didn't happen a lot sooner, right, a lot sooner. Uh, and I am a little bit surprised about the way it came down. But at the same time, I... The whole honest and the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth... Uh, I don't think you're going to hear from the Father Frank side at all. I'm sorry. All right. I'm sorry. I just, I know him long enough. Uh, I was involved in the organization long enough to know that there's always spin, that there's always a marketing, that there's always a rationalization. Uh, and I think uh, the biggest problem I have, the biggest problem I have, and I confronted Father Frank about this is the unwillingness to say that I'm sorry, the unwillingness to say that I was wrong, the unwillingness to say, hey, you know what, maybe I could have done things better. And I had a conversation with him and he got very, very angry at me. My brothers and sisters in Christ. I, that's uh, good right the there. You, we'll link to both of these video clips in, in their entirety so that you could see them for yourselves. But I think that is a good uh, illustration of sort of the other side of this conversation. It's clear to me anyway that there has been a very long track record of, of conflict, sort of a fighting for uh, who gets to decide certain things. In 2011, when he was restricted in, in Amarillo, uh, the arguments were over his financial practices as head of these organizations, Priests for Life and uh, Silent No More and, and all these others. And, uh, and then, of course, now it seems that it's his political uh, ideology, his political bent, his political preferences that seem to be at the heart of the issue. Now, he did use the GD in a response to, uh, to somebody talking about Joe Biden. And he admits that. He admits that in his video. He says, listen, I got heated. I got out of control. I went to confession for that. I repented, received absolution for that. Then he also put uh, the remains of a ba uh, an aborted baby on uh, an altar. Now, the problem is that altar is a table. Uh, it's not like a, a real altar. They use it to say mass there. But nonetheless, maybe that was done in bad taste. Um, the, but I think at the end of the day here, um, when I look at this, as I see both sides of the coin, on one side of the coin, you have a priest who's fighting for what he believes in. You know, he has unabashedly, unapologetically fought against the destruction of human life in the wombs of mothers, in the tunes of millions and millions and millions and millions. The wholesale slaughter of millions, tens of millions of human lives. Uh, should we not get out of control? Should we not get angry? Should we not get heated about that? Um, of course, his political support for Donald Trump got him in a ton of trouble. People did not like that. His outspoken uh, criticisms of the Democrat Party got, has gotten him in a ton of trouble. And again, I think that's at the heart of the issue, to be sure. The other side of that coin says, listen, priests cannot be kites flying in the wind. Priests are, are to be under the authority of their bishop. The bishop is the minister of the diocese. The bishop has priests working to assist him to provide the sacraments for the faithful, priests should not be little islands to themselves. There's also the, 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 the issue of the celebrity priest. 
I mean, we can all remember Father Karabi. Father Eitenhower is another good example of that. You know, uh, it's dangerous being a celebrity priest. Just ask one. Ask Father Leo why he left his diocese to go do his thing. It's dangerous. He has to walk a very fine line. He has to be careful. He has to, you know, guard his, his, uh, himself against certain temptations that will be prevalent to the celebrity priest, especially celebrity priest who does not live in community. There are dangers there, and I think that's what Father Imperato is referring to. So it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. There's two sides to this conversation. And ultimately, Father uh, Pravone has been the master of his own destiny in all, all of this. But at the end of the day, what do we see here? We see a great hypocrisy. Put anything Father Pravone has done uh, on hold for just one second, any, any wrongdoing on his part, disobedient, fighting against his bishop, let's just say, to maintain that, uh, maintain that control over his world and not give that up to somebody, especially somebody who doesn't agree with him. <clears throat> Put that to the side for a second. The late faithful are seeing great hypocrisy. We see a priest like Father Pavone, in spite of what he's done, being censured to the point where he's being removed from the priesthood. There's a great article from Father Gerald Murray on the canon law of the circumstances. Blasphemy, by the way, does not constitute removing someone from the priesthood. Very interesting. Disobedience can, though. Disobedience surely can. Maybe I will link to that article as well. But Father James Martin every day seems to embrace heresy. He gets away with it. Father Rupnik, the Jesuit who molested nine uh, nuns back in the 90s, his excommunication was lifted by His Holiness himself within hours. He gets to continue on in good standing. But Father Frank Pavone, with his many sins that he has repented of and confessed, and maybe, maybe, just maybe, his ongoing control issues, he doesn't get to continue on. There's a hypocrisy here. That is unjust. Let's pray and fast for Father Pravone. Let's pray and fast for Holy Mother Church. And those that make these decisions, because they do have authority. They have authority, and that's true. But that doesn't make it right. Hey, we'll be so as I said in our segment with Father Pravone, uh, on Father Pravone, there's two sides of the coin. Now, here's the article over Catholic News Agency with the headline that says, Canon Lawyer on Father Pravone's Dismissal from the Priesthood. Only the Pope can issue a decision without appeal. Mm. He says, on November the 9th, Cardinal Lazaro Yo Huang Sik, prefect for the Vatican's dicastery for the clergy, dismissed Father Frank Pavone from the priesthood for, quote, blasphemous communications on social media and persistent disobedience of lawful instructions of his diocese and bishop, close quote. The decree shared with U.S. bishops in a letter dated December the 13th, written by the Apostolic Nuncio of the United States, Archbishop Christophe Pierre precludes any possibility of appeal. Pavone, 63, is a longtime national director for the pro-life organization Priests for Life, who is well known for his pro-life activism, politically charged social media posts, and public support of former President Donald Trump. Pavone's sudden laicization has shocked many Catholics and pro-life advocates. It was huge news. We almost didn't get the news that Argentina won the, the, the football uh, World Cup thing because of this. It was so so monumental. The article goes on to say, among them, what are the specific canonical crimes with which Pravone was charged? And when and how was he notified uh, that he is no longer a priest? Pravone, for his part, claims he had no prior notification for the Vatican's action until contacted by CNA on December the 17th. Is this plausible? To better understand the church's laws and judici judicial processes involved in such a uh, case as this, they contacted Father Gerald Murray, someone else who has been on our program on more than one occasion. Uh, the article says, Ordinarily, it is the responsibility of the bishop of the diocese in which the accused priest is incarnated to investigate <coughs> accusations of blasphemous communications on social media and persistent disobedience of lawful instructions of his diocesan bishop, which are the two reasons given for Father Pavone's dismissal from the clerical state in a communication sent to the bishops of the United States by Archbishop Pierre. The Dawson Bishop, if he finds that a priest is guilty of such offenses, would then refer the matter to the Holy See if he judged that the penalty of removal from the clerical state was the appropriate punishment. The Dawson Bishop cannot, on his own authority, dismiss a priest of his diocese from the clerical state. Now, in, the, in that segment that, I, uh, that we covered this, I played for you a clip where Father Pavone states 
that in 2017, the bishop made clear to him that he intends to try to have him removed from the, on the priesthood. You can go back and watch that on our YouTube channel, Facebook, or elsewhere. Article goes on to say, furthermore, the Code of Canon Law does not state the possibility the, that the, let me start over. Furthermore, the Code of Canon Law does not state that the possible penalties for these two offenses include dismissal from the clerical state. Uh, that's important to, to emphasize. The Code of Canon Law, this is according to Father Gerald Murray, a canon lawyer, the Code of Canon Law does not state that the possible penalties for these two offenses include dismissal from the clerical state. Canon 1368 states that a person who utters blasphemy is to be punished with a just penalty. Canon 1371 states that a person who does not obey the lawful command of his ordinary and after being warned persists in disobedience is to be punished according to the gravity of the case with a censure or deprivation of office or with penalties mentioned in Canon 1336. Canon 1336 5, which is not included in the scope of punishments for a violation of Canon 1371, mentions dismissal from the clerical state. Thus, imposing dismissal from the clerical state for these offenses would require what happened in this case. That is, the issuance of what Archbishop Christoph Pierre, the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States, identified as a supreme decision, admitting of no possibility of appeal. Only the Pope, who enjoys full and supreme power in the Church, can issue such a decision against which there is no possible appeal. Ordinarily, the priest who has received such a penalty is informed in a timely fashion. It would be interesting to know if and when Father Pavone received a copy of the decree in which the supreme decision was handed down, and to see if the decree further specified the grounds upon which a decision was reached that he was guilty of blasphemy and disobedience. Father Pavone has been quoted as saying that he only learned of this decision, which Archbishop Pierre wrote was dated November the 9th, when CNA contacted him on the 17th. I find that very, very fascinating. So this, is, this has gone all the way to the top. Pope Francis had to sign off on this. And keep this in mind, as we stated in our 15 past segment last hour, Pope Francis just lifted the excommunication of a Jesuit priest who molested nine nuns back in the 90s. So, and he did that hours after that judgment came through. Just hours he lifted that. And yet uh, Father Frank Pavone is removed from the clerical state. Did he do things wrong? Yeah, I believe actually he did. Uh, and we, we talked about that in that segment last hour. We shared both sides of the coin. Um, he repented of the sin of uh, using GD in particular. He talked about using the baby, uh, the aborted baby on the, on the supposed altar, which is a table in his office. We talked about those infractions, and there's other issues, too, that go back years, many years, with Archbishop Zurich in Amarillo. So all of that is ongoing and known. But does that equate to him being removed from the priesthood? That's the question. Now, some have said that ultimately this is going to give our, uh, Father Frank Pavone even more opportunity because he will have less restrictions now as a layperson versus a priest. But nonetheless, we are seeing what we said in, the, in that segment, a hypocrisy, a rule, a, like a double standard. If we're going to apply the standard, then let's apply the standard universally, right? I think that's fair. If we're going to apply these standards to say zero tolerance, remember that zero tolerance we were promised after the summer of shame in 2018, the Cardinal McCarrick story? Remember when we, we, were, we were hoping that we would see a third party independent investigation to figure out exactly how... Cardinal McCarrick could become a cardinal so powerful in the church, be suppressed, and then be revived to continue to travel and negotiate the, the Sino-Vatican deal between China and the Vatican. Somehow, some way, he was able to continue his, his work in spite of the well-known allegations against him. Somehow, that was allowed to happen. He is now Mr. McCarrick, but we don't have any, we don't have any, we don't have any resolution on that. Did you hear of any resolution? Massive public scandal deserves a response to the public. We deserve to know what the deal is because there's a public scandal involved in that. So there seems to be a double standard in all of this. That the, Recently, the, the Jesuit uh, priest 
who was excommunicated is a great example of that. But there's tons of other examples that one might bring up to say there seems to be a double standard in all of this. Hold people accountable. Hold priests accountable. True. I realized over the weekend, um, I, I had to remind myself, I should say, that these men are humans. Sometimes I personally can put them on a pedestal and think, them, think of them in perfect ways. The reality is they're just as human and frail as you and me. They get angry. They lose their temper. They, 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 they sin. And they too, like me, get on their knees in the confessional and they beg the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to forgive them. And they are repentant for their sins and they receive absolution. They do penance and they are rectified and reconciled to God. If I can expect that treatment, why can't I expect that treatment for my priest? So there does seem to be a double standard. Let's pray for Father Pravone and for those that make these decisions. Ayush Das said Father Pravone should join the SSPX. No. I gonna highly happen. doubt that. Ain't gonna happen. He's not. A, I, he's not a traditional priest. Yeah, he's not a traditional priest. He doesn't say the yeah. traditional mass. And to be honest, and him, yeah. he, I don't think the society would want him because he. Um, has no. disobedience problems. Yeah. And they're very, yeah. very strict. They'd, they'd make him go back to seminary, and they make him go to a society but seminary. The other, the other thing about the Father Pavone story is, if you, if you, re, if you watch all of Father Imbarato's video, it's 17 minutes, and I linked oh, it. I put it, in, I put it in the chat so you could so go long. watch it. Let me tell you, it could have been eight minutes. It watch could, it Watch it in double time. That's exactly what I did. Yeah. I watched it twice, actually. Too many pauses. Um, but if you watch Father Imbarato, what he's trying to do is say, read between the lines here. I can't tell you specifics, but I can tell you I know. Um, this, he's going he's gonna to do better as a lay person than a priest. So, in other words, he has built himself a little good thing going on here. Doesn't want anybody else to have control over his baby. And now as a lay person, they definitely won't have control over it. Here's the other thing, too, back to the SSPX thing. What people don't realize, it's not just like a collection of ragtag members. It's This is actually a religious order, and you have to have a particular charism to join. It's not like, yeah. oh, all the cancel priests, send them to the SSPX. Like, no, yeah. that's not what the SSPX is. Yeah. It's not It's not this yeah. collection of rebels, okay? Yeah, yeah. By, by the way, just to me for clarify, Marta, we're glad you're here. And we are glad you're here. And we're, we're going to talk about Father Pavone here more. And by the way, that was a scripture joke. But hold on. Uh, let me just say this. If you're just joining us, we did two segments on Father Pavone already in this show. Uh, two on the air. We did one in the first hour, the 15 past, and we did another one at the top of this hour. So you can always rewind and watch those as well. So you can get more of our take, or my take, I should say, <laughs> on the Father Pavone story. But we'll, we'll continue to talk about it now. Well. Yeah, the other thing is, uh, and because here's another, another thing, and I, I don't mean to... Uh, be nitpicky, but uh, the SSPX is also not a religious order. It's a society of apostolic life, which is like the fraternity. The fraternity is also not a religious order. The Institute of Christ the King is a religious order in a sense. They're, they're canons, um, so it's slightly different as well. All these different categories mm -hmm. of things, but the fraternity and the society, they don't take religious vows. They don't take the ch vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, so they're more similar to diocesan priest in that sense, uh, except they live in community and have a shared charism, and that's yeah. what unites them. Yeah, but a slight, slight thing. So let us know what your thoughts and opinions are of Father uh, Frank Pavone. You know, I think I'm going to continue to call him Father, uh, just like uh, uh, Father Imperato said. He's going to continue to call him Father as well. I Indelible think, mark on his soul. Yeah, I mean. He wants, uh, you know, you are a priest forever, according mm -hmm. to Order of Melchizedek, right? So, yeah, yeah although he doesn't have sac he doesn't have faculties, he cannot say the mass now, even for himself. Well, he's not allowed to. He's not allowed to. Um, but nonetheless, I'm just going to continue to call him Father. Now, again, I I see both sides to the to the, the the argument here. I see both sides. There were issues of obedience with Father Pavone. There's, I think it's clear he was fighting to control what he built. And didn't want to give that over to anyone for any reason whatsoever. So there's some definite issues there. Father Eitenhauer, and it's the cult of personality I think is also should be looked at in this conversation. Uh, Father Crappi, huge cult of personality. Yeah. And I can tell you from pers personal, firsthand experience, because I had to deal with Father Crappi and his organization for a time towards those latter years. So I have some experience there that I can speak of personally. Was this the priest that w went 
and started the the black dog yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. By the way, uh, in spite of what anybody has told you, because I, I I don't know if you guys have heard, but I've had like four people, five people who are like famous popular Catholics, oh yeah, he's in a monastery, he's this, he's, he's not in a monastery. He is not, okay? I know I have a personal acquaintance, a friend, who speaks to him on a fairly regular basis by telephone, and he's not in a monastery. He lives in Montana, in his little private hermitage, under no one's authority, doing his own thing. But he's been laid aside, so he doesn't need to be under anybody's authority. And, uh, I don't know if he sold off his Harleys. I have no idea. But apparently he did not sell off his Montana cabin. I would have liked to see Montana. Yeah. You know, here's the thing <laughs> about, uh, about this. The, there's so many. The, okay, so these kind of celebrity priests. The problem with this is the state of religious communities and the state of, of the world in that sense. Because this kind of like celebrity priest status, the priests who do these public uh, displays, which I think are very, very important. We need mm. priests to do this. Traditionally speaking, they'd be part of religious orders. Now, Father Karapi was technically part of a religious order. Yeah, however, no, he, no, he was. He was. However, not te- technically, well, he I know. Was I say te- order, the yeah. reason why I say technically is because technically means actually he was actually part of religious order, but he wasn't actually part of the religious order because he wasn't traveling with religious order. He wasn't. He was on his own. He was doing his own well, thing. Uh, can I tell and you? So I can tell you what happened. Right. Well, I, I was hold there. on one second. So the idea here is that you're supposed to, in a religious order, when you go and do these kind of missionary things, you travel with other priests who are part of your religious order, and there are set rules for missionary priests. So if you look at the rules, like for instance, the Passionist, they have very strict rules when they go and do their retreats, when they go and do their missionary activity, they're not allowed to eat with certain people, they're not allowed to go, and this isn't like a St. Paul, St. Peter type thing, where St. Peter's like, I don't want to eat with you because you're bad. It's like, no, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you get a big head, where you get a celebrity status, where you have these kind of things happening and these religious orders were built and created in order to defend you from this and now you have priests that are part of religious orders that are legitimately part of religious orders are doing these things but Mm -hmm. they are not being held to account from the very beginning and once they get humongous then the religious order or the local bishop is like whoa 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 how did this happen and they step in and it's like at this point there are it's already you're down uh, the block 10 blocks on the road yeah for sure Uh, they did try to rope him back in I can tell you that personally I know that firsthand, um, but he refused to come. He asked to be laicized. They tried to talk him out of it, Father Grappi, and he insisted. And uh, unfortunately, at the exact same time, was another priest of the same order who was my spiritual director at the time, also asked to be laicized for very similar reasons. He wasn't at the celebrity status, so that wasn't the problem, but he wanted to be independent. He just wanted to do his thing. He didn't want, he didn't want anybody telling him what to do or how to do it. He didn't want to have to live in community. He wanted to be doing his thing. And when that no longer was possible, and they were like, you got to come back. You got to be in community. You got to be a part of the order, not just a satellite, a kite flying in the wind. <coughs> um, he, he asked to be laicized. So it's, uh, it was a tragedy to, to lose both of those. Uh, for, for Father Karapi, you know, he was really out of control. I'm going to be honest with you. I can tell you firsthand stories. But this, one of the tragedies in that story was we, the church lost an effective communicator. Like, he knew how to communicate. Yeah, he was a good speaker. He was a good speaker. And imagine if he could have humbly accepted that obedience, come back to the order, we would still have an effective communicator today. Yeah. And we, we are at a loss for that now. Yes, it's really... The Father Eitenhower, do you guys remember Father Eitenhower from uh, pre, uh, the... Uh, what was it... Um, the the pro life organization international something I forget the name of it all of a sudden off the top of my head he was do he was also doing uh, a series on exorcisms and the occult well he got into an, an emotional relationship with a woman caused a scandal his bishop recalled him because this is the deal a priest has to be under a bishop a priest can't be again a kite in the wind that's not how it's that's not what God designed that's not what Jesus wanted when he created his church the the priest serves under a bishop, under a superior. That's the design. They're not supposed to be out doing their own thing. So it's dangerous when those circumstances are allowed to happen. They are allowed to happen, but they're dangerous. They can be very dangerous. So Father Eitenauer is out, and he gets into this situation, it's scandal, and his bishop recalls him. He 
obediently goes back and does whatever the bishop wants him to do. He, you never hear from him again. He is out of the public life. He has been now for many years. Um, praise be to God. I would say that is a good example of what a priest ought to do in humility. And I think that's what Father Imperato is referring to in the Father Pavon case as well. But again, there's two sides to this. Uh, there is an ongoing battle between Father Pavone and the Bishop in Amarillo. The Bishop in Amarillo clearly does not want him doing what he's, what he's doing. You know, quite, argue, quite possibly you can make a strong case that it's because he doesn't approve his politics. Yeah, okay, great. But at the end of the day, he has to be in the authority of a bishop. Now, I don't understand. There is a, I got to go back and look because I, I, I pulled up the example of Father Leo Padalinhug, another popular priest. Uh, who who asked to be let go of his diocese? He was a he was a teacher. He was a professor at the seminary uh, at, in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and he asked to be uh, released from his bishop. His bishop released him. So here's here's the thing that bothers me about this whole thing. Uh, yes, all everything has being said is true, but that's not actually the point. No, I mean, there's there's a, a disobedient priest or a dime a dozen. All these things happen. Priests mishandling money is a dime a dozen. We just reported, Bree Dale reported from Daily Wire about the priest who is selling Vatican art, the, the intellectual property of it, making tens of thousands of dollars or more. Um, at the end of the day, yeah, these things happen. It's bad. It's not good. Here's the real problem. The real problem is this is a, a use this is a, a test case to now apply this to priests who have nothing wrong with them. And they always do this. They always do this. They did this they, Precedent. Both, both in the secular world and in the religious world. They, they do this. The secular world, what did they do? They canceled Alex Jones off of social media. And every, no one cared. Everyone was like, well, it's Alex Jones. He says crazy things. He has conspiracy theories. When he's also bombastic. We don't even like him anyway. And so nobody came out to defend Alex Jones. Then what do they start doing? First, they, they start for the gypsy. They start banning other people, and then what do they do? They ban Donald Trump off of social media. And then they start banning random Twitter users who are like whatever off of so uh, Twitter, Facebook. Are uh, uh, my buddy um, uh, Josh Patterson? He gets banned off of Facebook like every week for saying super innocuous things. It's ridiculous. That's a precedent. <laughs> the same thing they do in the church. They promote you away to somewhere. Or, in this case, they're setting a precedent now where they're, they're having a canonical trial without you present. He's never been given his, di in his exact charges. Yeah. He's giving general charges because now you can say, okay, now I, I can now start digging around if things start coming up. Now I can apply whatever it is. And now people are coming up. Well, Father did do X, Y, or Z, so it does make sense that he get in trouble. What are his specific accusations he said he makes blasphemous commentary what is a specific accusation is it the blasphemy that we talked about on the show because that's not actually what they quoted they just said blasphemous and we're just guessing we're saying okay it was probably this thing that he said oh it's probably this thing that he did but we don't actually know they don't tell us and this is a big deal because now they can apply this to any priest any priest can be okay you did x y or z well, tell me what exactly did i do wrong i can repent of it i can do whatever it is i need to do yeah. the response is to just laicize you and so now he had, he they said he has no means of of uh of defending himself now mm -hmm. he cannot appeal it that's absurd that's crazy and the canonical lawyers are, are chiming in but ultimately who cares about canonical lawyers who cares about the canon law if it comes down from rome because this order came down from Rome. If they appeal it, what are they going to do? If Pope Francis decides, okay, well, I'm just not going to hear your case. What, who, who do you have to hear? Yeah. It'd be like if the Supreme Court went well, all the way to the Supreme Court and ignored it. We're already seeing this trend. The, the bishop in Puerto Rico, dismissed. There was a bishop in Tennessee, dismissed. I mean, they don't get reassigned. They just, bye. Enjoy your retirement. Yep. That's it. I mean, we're so, and how many, how many priests are canceled in all of this? I know priest. You know? I know priest who, and uh, this might be slightly scandalous, but I know priests <laughs> who have not been excommunicated. They're in perfectly good standing. They have, there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. They've never been, have any kind of censure whatsoever mm -hmm. who say mass to this day right. publicly, but they have no canonical mission because they were just told one day, yeah, don't you're, you're gone from this, from this parish. Yeah, don't and they're up. like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Your excellency. Uh, so where am I going now? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. So what did the priest do? Well, he 
continues the work of priesthood. He keeps doing the things he's doing. Now, is that the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing, yeah. thing to do? I don't know. But it, it's the reality of the situation. Uh, they're already doing these kind of things where they're greatness. punishing you without actually punishing you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I keep pointing this out, you know. I was having this conversation. By the way, if you're if you're new to watching us right now, do us a favor and subscribe, share, like, hit the. That would help us grow. Uh, we would be very grateful to you. So uh, you know, send some love, give us a thumbs up, a rant, or wherever you're watching right now, and share us with a friend. That'd be fantastic. But uh, you know, I, I I had to remind my wife because it seems it's unjust. It's an unjust application of uh, you know, and this is duplicity. There's there's hypocrisy in this. Yeah, do I believe a Father Pavone uh, did some things that he shouldn't have done? Yeah, I, I think he did. Do I think he deserves this? No, absolutely not. I don't think that. Um, how can we live in a world? How can we accept that he deserves to be completely laicized for his infractions, which he he did admit to, you know, be getting angry and saying the GD, which I thought was terrible when he said it. To me. Yeah, I, when I remember seeing it, I'm like, what? Well, who does this? Yeah, I would never say that, ever. Like, yeah. I mean, that's no, he should have never done that. Uh, so, yeah, he's done some things. His continued fight in, uh, f with his bishop over disobedience, that's a problem. It is a problem. Okay, I'm not going to pretend it's not. But does he deserve this? No, he doesn't. And we live in a world where a Jesuit priest who molested nine nuns gets a pass. Um, uh, Cardinal or, or Archbishop Zucchetta gets a pass. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many examples. Father James Martin, every day embracing the homosexual lifestyle, gets a pass. Now, you might argue, but Joe, Father James Martin does not uh, argue in disobedience to his bishop. You're right, because his bishop accepts it and lets it go. Uh, bishop Neistout's in trouble right now for allegedly covering up uh, a sexual predator priest. And uh, George Newmeyer was uh, confronting him over the weekend, and he got banned. He got lifetime banned from the, from the cathedral. You should check out uh, George Newmeyer's Twitter feed for details on that story. You know, like, so there's so many examples that the, pre the Italian priest who said mass in the water without a shirt on in his bathing suit on a float, Disgusting. on a float with teenagers in Sacrilid, scantily blasphemy. clad bathing suits, he got a pass. He didn't get uh, censured. He got, I think he got a, a stern talking to by his bishop, and that was the extent of it. Like, that's it. He gets a pass, but Father Frank Pavone gets tossed from the priesthood. That's, that's not good. That's a double standard. That's a hypocrisy. And if you're going to apply the, the, if you're going to apply this, apply it evenly. Yeah, I agree. And the other thing is these, uh, the accusation of blasphemy, I think, I think you read this, uh, you, you I may have mentioned it off air, that the accusation of blasphemy does not have a canonical penalty. No, I read it on air. Oh, you did read it. I read it from the okay. article from I Father thought, Gerald Murray. Yeah, that's what I thought. Do you I want to remember it again? Or? No, I mean, I was just yeah. making the point that this is not a canonical crime. It's a sin. It's now, a mortal sin. Yeah. And if in a just society, the blasphemy would be punished to the highest degree. Like, this is a very, very mm. grave crime. King Louis the Ninth, yeah. he would give you a correction <laughs> once, he'd scourge you, and if yeah. you blasphemed, and if he did it a second time, yeah, then oh, yeah. he'd execute you. So, yeah. I mean, it's, this is a grave, grave evil blasphemy, and we need to take it very seriously. But are we applying that across the board? Are we going to start? Is the, is, the, is the bishops of Rome, and please, I would love this. I would love this. Are the bishops of Rome going to come out and publicly condemn blasphemy and order all Catholics saying, yeah. hey, we're gonna, this is going to be an excommunicatable offense from now on. If you commit the sin of blasphemy, you are going to be excommunicated and make that a rule and say we're using but, Father Pavone as a test case just to show thing, our point. That would be, that'd be interesting. If we're talking about the devils and the details, who who came up with that statement, by the way? <laughs> the devil's in the details. So, all right. So, uh, Father Frank Pavone, uh, which I played the clip of him actually addressing this in the first segment that I dealt with this today. So, you can always rewind. Check it out. First hour. Um, from his, He actually says this was part of what they got him on, was using the GD in a Twitter response talking about Biden. GD Biden. Is basically what he said. You know, he used expletives. He used the GD. Again, I, I, I couldn't stand that when he did that. When I saw that, I'm like, oh, dude, that's wrong. Like, you shouldn't be talking this way. Uh, we, we, need, we need to take the higher road uh, because our enemies will use this against us. Clearly, they have used it against him. And he knows that. He said he went to confession. He confessed this. And he made penance. Praise God. That's all anybody could ask at this point. But... Um, 
is the use of that GD and like did, did he really intend to condemn Biden to hell forever? I mean like you know what I mean like does that does that use case l arise to the level of blasphemy? Isn't blasphemy part of the isn't part of blasphemy not just the words you say but the intent behind it? Well, I mean I guess there's a casual mm, blasphemy. Yeah. There's a casual like in other words don't even play around with these words. Like don't even yeah. don't think them, don't say them. Like I get that. Like for, yeah, fair enough. But there, there's one thing to say, Father, you shouldn't talk that way, versus, Father, for your crime, we are casting you out of the priesthood. Like, that's a whole other level that seems disproportionate to the crime. Yeah, and I mean, I've certainly heard priest blasphemy before, especially the casual way. Not like, like you're saying, there's a difference between intentional and then casual. And 99% of the time, it's casual. Uh, e either way, it's both bad. One is just worse. There's mm -hmm. degrees of bad. Mm -hmm. And so casual blasphemy is obviously a lesser sin, but it's still a mortal sin to, to blaspheme. And the, but if you're going to be intentionally doing it, then it becomes a grave, grave evil. So. Yeah. Yeah. So now I guess the other thing that could be said here is we're eight o'clock and running out of time. The, if the Pope wanted to, he could reinstate him. Yeah. He has the authority to do so. I mean, he did for that bishop. He's, I mean, yeah, the, oh, bishop, there, the Jesuit. There, there, Jesuit. Are, there are priests all the time that get reinstated after having left the priesthood personally or, or whatever. I mean, there's lots of stories of the Pope. I had a pastor who did that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it could happen. So who knows? He could be Father Frank Pavone again. It's possible. Yeah. Let's pray for him. Let's pray for the church. Uh, we cannot get...